All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Judy Marquez Kiyama. What a privilege it is to join you once again for our year long HSI webinar series centering servingness. I serve as the Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Development here at the University of Arizona, and I'm excited to welcome you on behalf of Faculty Affairs and HSI initiatives. Uh, we kick off this year's webinar series during National HSI Week, which is a week in which the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, HACU, calls on HSIs to join in observance, to celebrate and build awareness of the work and the important role that HSIs play in improving access to education, advancing equity practices, and the contributions that HSIs make to their communities. This is also the kickoff to Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month um, and the honoring of many Hispanic and Latinx Independence Days. Today, we honor Mexican Independence Day, and we also recognize that many are reflecting on and celebrating Yom Kippur today. When I reflect back on last year's series, I'm so proud to say that we engaged um, that celebration, the awareness building, the collective knowledge creation all year long, and I'm confident that we'll continue to do so this year. The U of A received its HSI designation in April of 2018 and has been recognized by both Excelencia in Education and HACU for leadership and commitment to Latinx and Hispanic student success. We also want to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the, to the Orom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign na native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. And we come to this notion of servingness by drawing upon Dr. Gina Garcia's extensive body of work and feature faculty and staff who engage in scholarship and servingness efforts that honor the cultures and the lived experiences of Latino, Latino, Latinx, Black, Indigenous, underrepresented, underrepresented students and communities, BIPOC communities. Um, and many of you have heard me say this before, and I offer it again for those who may be joining for the first time. The goals of this series are threefold. One, by spotlighting current scholarship, we offer examples of the rich ways in which servingness is enacted by faculty and staff across the institution. We invite others on campus and nationally to learn about and engage in these efforts, and we build knowledge. Each month, we address the question, what next steps are needed to build institutional capacity around HSI servingness? And so this month, we kick off um, with an incredible scholar, Farid Matuk. We are joined today by Professor Matuk, who is an associate professor in the Department of English. Bio captures the following. A queer writer of mixed Syrian and Peruvian heritage, Farid Matuk has lived in the US since the age of six as an undocumented person, a quote unquote legal resident, and a naturalized citizen. He is the author of poetry collections, This Is a Nice Neighborhood, The Real Horse, and several chat books, including My Daughter La Chola. His work has been anthologized in the best American experimental poetry and in Angels of the Americlips, an anthology of new Latina Latino writing, among many others. Farid serves as poetry editor at Fence and on the editorial board for the book series, Research and Creative Writing at Bloomsbury. His work has been supported most recently by residencies and grants from the Headland Center for the Arts, the Lannan Foundation, and a visiting Holloway professorship in poetry and poetics at UC Berkeley. For his book arts project, Redolent, made in co collaboration with visual artist Nancy Friedemann Sanchez, is forthcoming from Sinking Saw Press. It is my pleasure to turn this webinar over and welcome Professor Farid Matuk. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump right into it since, uh, since time is precious. And I'm glad you mentioned. Dr. Gina Garcia, because that was the first source I went to in preparing for this talk. So to open up, I want to thank Dr. Marcus Guillama and Dr. Marla Franco and colleagues across sectors in the university who work to realize the promise of U Arizona's Hispanic serving designation through the lens of servingness. 
which put simply by Dr. Gina Garcia in her article, Defining Servingness, means that we move beyond merely enrolling Latinx identified students to actually serving their needs and supporting their success. However, I wanna suggest humbly and respectfully that the field of HSI work embedded as it is in the modern university may have a problem endemic to the modern university. That problem is the belief forwarded by the managerial class that we cannot solve or even improve that which we cannot measure. In supporting some equity initiatives for the university, I've developed a limited understanding of data work and a great respect for data professionals for the complex nuance of their tasks, the balance they must strike, for example, between making demographic markers legible while leaving actual people to their privacy, the cultural challenges of building trust as institutions ask populations to self-identify along various demographic categories, and the translational work data professionals and institutional leaders must do between federally recognized demographic designations and the more nuanced data that would help set priorities that align with local conditions at a given school. Yet Garcia's Defining Serving This article articulates a contradiction in the way that the dogma of data makes contact with the simple but slippery concept of serving this. Garcia notes that, quote, indicators of serving are things HSI leaders can measure to assess servingness. These measurable indicators include what she terms academic outcomes such as graduation rates, transfer rates, course completion uh, rates, labor market outcomes, and STEM degree completion, a priority, she notes, for the federal government. And though a handful of studies indicate that what Garcia terms non-academic outcomes really do have, quote, great importance to the academic success of Latinx students in college, Garcia's review of the field leads her to note that that a, quote, majority of researchers and practitioners primarily focus on academic outcomes and rarely consider non-academic ones, end quote. Examples of non-academic indicators, she tells us, include academic self-concepts, leadership identity, racial identity, critical consciousness, graduate school aspirations, and civic engagement. Though Garcia doesn't make the point explicitly I infer that those researchers and practitioners maintain a bias for academic indicators because they are easier to measure. Certainly, graduation rates are easier to track than a change in one's critical consciousness. And course completion rates are more available than a measure of change in a student's racial identity. One problem is that institutional leaders do need a sharper critical consciousness when designing the questions that drive data coding and data mining in the first place. Another problem is that we accept and maybe reproduce the binary between academic and non-academic indicators. But I want to propose that a more central problem is that our frameworks, particularly the framework of metrics, are simultaneously so daunting, so challenging, and so unambitious. I do not say this glibly. Those professionals on campus who dedicate themselves to reducing harm and creating more equitable experiences for students and employees do well to measure indicators for change and doing so through the challenges of data and institutional culture is not easy. Measurable work is in fact meaningful work. Every time colleagues across fields such as communications, public health, ethnic studies collaborate to tackle something like measurable medical or nutritional disparities, for example, I know that they will produce knowledge that will improve and maybe even save lives. When a cultural student resource center on campus can say that it is finally fully staffed and is thereby able to serve more students, both measurable indicators, I know that harm experienced by students due to systemic oppression will be reduced. But these are extreme times that may require extreme imaginations. Is free market capitalism, particularly on a global scale, delivering prosperity or supporting a global oligarchy in the task of pillaging? Will modern republics expand electoral enfranchisement across demographically diverse populations? Or will they codify ethno-nationalism in their legal frameworks and public institutions? Will some combination of regulations and technology slow the effects of climate change? Or will corporate and government leaders opt instead to cultivate 
widespread loss of habitat and resources into new unimagined markets? Will nonprofit and government entities manage and stabilize populations displaced by ever more frequent waves of climate and other forms of man-made catastrophe? Or will the ranks of forcibly displaced peoples continue to grow? Will you and I be among them? In a recent public radio interview, foreign, cor foreign correspondent Clarissa Ward detailed a moment during the US evacuation of Afghanistan that helps to crystallize these exceedingly broad questions into a single question that well represents the type of problem that lies beyond metrics, the unfathomable begging to be fathomed. The context to the scene that Ward describes is that Ward and her associates have secured access by means she must keep secret from the interviewer to a gate into Kabul airport that is rarely opened. Their access to the departing flights should go unnoticed. However, things don't go as planned. And here I'll quote Ward at length. She says, but we went to this gate at 6 a.m. in the morning and all of us looked at each other because there were about 50 or 60 people there already. And we were like, okay, this can't be right because how are we going to push through this tiny door in the gate when there's 50 to 60 people already here crammed outside it? And basically, we all had held hands and kind of formed like a chain. And someone opened the gate and started to try to pull us through. And it was this awful moment because the entire crowd, the minute they saw the door open, just started pushing and crushing and screaming. And there were little children who were howling and wailing. And you were standing there thinking, this is so wrong. Like, why do I get to go in just because I have this passport? Like, it just feels very wrong. And my crew managed to get in before me. We had a couple of Afghans, nationals who we were bringing out with us. And then I was the last one. And the crowd was sort of closing in. And this person on the other side just grabbed my arm and just ripped me through the door. And honestly, I think all of us were crying because it was so heartbreaking and intense and visceral. And the minute the gate closed and I started talking to the man who had grabbed me and I said, how are you dealing with this? And he just started bawling. He started weeping. And he said, you know, I've done two tours of duty in Helmand province and the PTSD I will have from the last week is much worse. And he was seeing people being trampled to death every day. He saw women throwing babies over the wire to try to get them out safely. And those images don't leave you. Terry Gross, the interviewer responds with, so you think about all of that every time you look at your bruise? Clarissa Ward responds, I do. I do and there's such guilt, Terry, with that because I was pushing too. I was pushing too. And you were so protected from those moments of just sheer survival usually in our kind of Western lives. And this was a moment where there was no veneer of respectability or politeness. It was push and shove and scrape and push to get in there and get out safely. So that's, I'll stop quoting from Clarissa Ward's interview there. There are many measurable quantitative interventions that scholars and universities might make if not directly in a scene like the one Ward describes and in the lead up and in the aftermath of such a scene. And the work of psychologists and understanding and pioneering new therapies for PTSD to name only one, it's already well documented. And though maybe somewhat less quantifiable scholars in the areas of law, political science, economics, sociology, history, English, philosophy, gender and women's studies, and many others, can all contribute to students, quote, critical consciousness for the motivations for and consequences of going to war. But there's a deeper question buried in Ward's testimony. Quote, she says, why do I get to go in just because I have this passport? It just feels very wrong. And again, toward the end of her narrative, quote, we're so protected from those moments of just sheer survival, usually in our kind of Western lives. And this was a moment where there was no veneer of respectability or politeness. Ward's 
attempt to understand her experience delivers us onto a threshold of a dangerous and painful, but I think inescapable field of imagination. And I make this claim fully understanding that there are testimonies of Afghanis who could not pass the gate, who could not get on the plane, who have no privileged relation to US nationals, or at least none that US nationals would recognize when it mattered most. And I recognize we could attempt instead to gather around the Afghani point of view. But I choose here to center a white US American journalist to call forth for indictment, indictment those of us who would claim US passports, who have sympathy with US nationalism. A nationalism that, despite its propaganda to the contrary, is organized to exclude Black and Indigenous people and so-called foreign people from its center, while making Black and Indigenous people and lands and foreign people and lands available to perpetual extraction of value. For reference, see the fee structures for the Ferguson Police Department's traffic code. See any of the recent water defender and pipeline struggles. See the 20 years war in Afghanistan that served as a cover for a massive wealth transfer out of the US tax base and into the hands of transnational security contractors and weapons firms. See any of us who are currently or have ever offered essential labor in this country in fields such as elder care, agriculture and manufacturing and invisible domestic work without the benefits of documentation to name only four broad modes of state-sponsored extraction. I lied. There's never really a single representative question about anything, much less about what lies beyond metrics. So here's a cluster of questions that emerge for me from considering Ward's testimony and its limits of imagination in light of what I contend to be the nation state's foundational primary project of simultaneous exclusion and extraction. What if there were no nation states? Which is a way to ask, what if there were no borders and no passports? Which is a way of asking, what if there were no systems to hoard resources while segregating the supposedly safe from the vulnerable? Abolition always sounds absurd. It must, if it questions our foundations. But the abolitional imagination is not frivolous. As theorists Stefano Harney and Fred Moten and others have said, Abolition only seeks to end systems to clear cut the foundations because it is so deeply invested in building, holding new ways of living. In other words, it's not one or the other between radical abolition imagination and technocratic managerial acumen. The dual function of destroying and building requires radical abolitional questions that can't be measured. The work of imagining them can't be measured. But once imagination delivers us to those questions, then technocratic brilliance becomes applicable and maybe even necessary. And it's important to underscore that an abolitional lens can be developed by those working in many disciplines, including historians and philosophers and cultural theorists and scholars of criminal punishment. But an abolitional lens is most fully formed in the work of those involved directly with translating care into organized rebellion people engaged in what scholar Joy James terms the captive maternal. However, in the remaining portions of this talk, I'd like to explore a little bit of the limited but unique contributions poets have to make to such work. How poets as technicians of the imagination can crystallize the way we actually want to sacrifice everything to realize justice, to realize abolition, and to realize the conditions for imagining new social formations. Though everyone is responsible, albeit differently responsible, for imagining ways to new forms of society, Latinx people are positioned in a particular way to that responsibility. Maybe as Luis Valdez, founder of Campesino Theater says, we Latinx people are Americans in the hemis hemispheric sense, not the nationalist sense. And this is not necessarily a point of pride. We emerge at the intersections of slavery, settler colonialism, indigenous lifeways, and pointedly, we remain marginalized from US nationalism, even as some of us dream of it and kill for it. 
It is my contention that Latinx people and Latinx students are already imagining new forms of society. See not only Luis Valdez's visionary work as he activated the parallel and dialogic ways labor struggle and theater imagine new worlds, but see also the visionary work of the art collective ASPO, who in the early 1970s through into the 1990s invented a deeply influential, radical performative conceptual art practice out of the streets of East LA. To the extent that servingness is bound with metrics, it may be limiting its own capacity to activate, or maybe better said, it may be fail failing to get out of the way of Latinx energy that is drawn to radical abolitional thought and imagination that always has been and always will be. I had hoped to say something about the arbitrary and contingent nature of English literary studies as a scholarly discipline by offering a quick sketch of the discipline's history, a history that is bound up with class struggle and state systems of control. I had hoped to say something about what poet Shelley called poetry in the general sense, poetry's pervasive, irrepressible, but often undetectable role in the lives of students and colleagues. I had hoped to say something about how theorist Gayatrix Spivak understood reading literary works to be, quote, the uncoercive rearrangement of desires, because just reading, quote, is sending oneself into the text of the other. I'd hoped to say something about how poetry is uniquely suited to that rearrangement because it works along the double edge of body and breath to activate entanglement at the molecular level, because it combines thinking and feeling so it sets students up to integrate the intuitive and the intellectual, the public and the private. There's so much potential that we might try to explore what we could call crew, creative writing everywhere, alongside something like writing across the curriculum, which we term WAC. I'll set aside some notes on uh, specifically on, on uh, some grant work that was done last year um, that can speak to the question of increasing capacity towards servingness and transition to the next part of the talk that focuses specifically on the work of translating and, uh, and reissuing this seminal transformative book written by Juan Felipe Herrera, Acrylica. In this part of the talk, I'll be speaking in the we pronoun, uh, to honor the labor of my co-editors for this project, Carmen Jimenez-Smith and Anthony Cody. This part of the talk is called Like a Capital X Upon the Land of the South. El 16 de octubre del año pasado, 77, David Duke, el líder nacional de los Cuckoo Clan, anunció en la televisión en San Diego que iba a iniciar una campaña por California para informarle al público de lo que él considera el peligro del indocumentado en esta nación. Salvador Mercado. And my translation of that is on the 16th of October of last year, 1977, David Duke, the national leader of the Ku Klux Klan announced on television in San Diego that he was going to begin a campaign through California to inform the public about what he considers the danger of the undocumented in this country. Salvador Mercado. So that's the epigraph to this part of the talk. Originally released as a bilingual collection in 1989 by Stephen Kessler's Alcatraz editions, Juan Felipe Herrera wrote the poems of Acrylica starting in 1977, occasioned by the energy and dialogue that he encountered upon meeting writer and co-conspirator Francisco Alarcón, just as they were both beginning graduate study at Stanford. Through a new interview included in this new edition, and through his own visual introduction, Herrera himself offers a rich set of references, inspirations, and influences that shaped Acrylica while sharing his take on this singular book's place in his development as a poet and multimedia artist. But with that epigraph from Salvador Mercado, we begin gathering the constellation of urgencies that called us to create this new edition and new translation of Acrylica in the first place. The timeline of the Chicano movement from farm, work, farm worker struggles of the early 60s to the mass high school student walkouts in Los Angeles, to the electoral and curricular struggles of the 70s and 80s is well doc documented and roughly coincides with Herrera's youth and young adulthood. But the timeline's legibility 
proffers a vantage point that would seem outside of or just ahead of its events. Prompted by Herrera's dedication of the poem Duda Las Duces to Sal Mercado, we searched for the activist story and found resonances with our own moment that make the timeline actually circle back. In 1977, just as Herrera was leaving San Diego for Stanford, David Duke, then a KKK leader, garnered media attention by setting up KKK patrols along the Mexico-US border. A transcript of an oral history interview with Mercado housed in the archives of the University of Texas, El Paso, details how the activists drew on existing relationships in the community to lead a group in disrupting one of Duke's press conferences that took place at a US border patrol station. The border patrol sympathy for Duke and the KKK forced the anti-immigrant, I'm sorry, the anti-racist protesters to battle state and militia forces simultaneously. Grandstanding and media savvy, normalizing white supremacist ideology while furthering political ambitions, Duke is an obvious precursor to Donald Trump. But we need only look to Barack Obama's Operation Streamline, Bill Clinton's urban immigration raids, and Newt Gingrich's anti-immigrant contract with America platform to remember that the criminalization of migrants conjoined to the fantasy of threatening Latinx bodies is a perennial and necessary building block in state consolidation of power. This ongoing project of power has everything to do with our return to Acrylica more than 30 years after its initial publication. The idea, idea of literary recuperation stokes in us equal parts humility and suspicion. Mindful of our position in the broader landscape of small presses, we hope to bring Acrylica into new conversations among new readers. Yet we approach this project with suspicion of the broader literary conversation in the US and of the institutions committed to its perpetuation. We recognize that the network of institutions that make up US letters are recently more inclusive of so-called people of color. Still, this network remains committed to a market logic where exclusionary gatekeeping ensures scarcity. Scarcity confers value onto publicists and name brand credentials, and in turn, promise as access. In this economy, institutions can activate the exceptionally decorated poet of color as cover for their continued dismissal of generational peers and fellow travelers. Juan Felipe Herrera has rightly, we think, received spoils from the system, not least of which is his position as the first ever Latinx US poet laureate. Meanwhile, Francisco Alarcón, Wanda Coleman, Lorenzo Thomas, Cherry Moraga, Jane Cortez, and many others recede further into the niches and curios of literary history. But Acrylica has helped us understand that our experiences of literary institutions must stand alongside a critique of the received notions of the literary as such and of its subcategories, including those of genre and poetics. In other words, this project is not one of inclusion or recovery. This is a project of retrieval. We steal Acrylica away from literary institutions, away from the discipline of literature as such, and away from traditions of experimental poetics that should hope to claim it. Acrylica belongs somewhere else. It belongs in the hands of those finding one another in a gathering that has yet to take place. It is true as we told ourselves when first imagining Acrylica's new edition, that despite Herrera's accolades, his work as a whole has been excluded from genealogies of experimental or avant-garde US poetry. And it's true that Acrylica perhaps best represents the exploratory and innovative strains in his writing. And we are not so obtuse as to suggest that something wasn't lost when poets who see themselves as Chicanx or Latinx and who wanted to write difficult poetry could not find someone with whom they might identify included in the canons of innovative writing. We know our own writing practices suffered for passing through sites where these genealogies were packaged and presented, whether it be at MFA programs or the extra academic poetry scenes in the Bowery or Boulder or Bolinas without having encountered Acrylica or a book like it on the reading list that were handed to us. We submit though, that Herrera's exclusion as a representative of a particular, if diasporic and contested ethnicity 
from any given field of poetics matters less than the way that diminishing Herrera as an experimental writer helps demarcate the fields of narrative and experimental poetry, quietude and avant-garde as stably opposed in exceedingly narrow spaces. Whether process-based or self-reflexively pointing back to the materiality of language, whether committed to jarring juxtapositions delivered in breezy tones or in fractured grammars, U.S. innovative poetry, in our view, has tended to opt for specialization. Though there have always been unassimilable and capacious exceptions, the story of the field has most often followed a formula of narrow parameters that, in turn, have stoked fervently argued and entrenched defenses that pass for our poetics. With the breadth of his experiments in Acrylica, Herrera offers us the alternative of remaining undefended and unhoused by the confines of category. The experimentation in Acrylica is lexical by way of exuberant compound neologisms that in multilingual diction where Portuguese destabilizes the primacy of Spanish. The experimentation here is generic, where the sonic intensity of the lyric and the popular portraiture of the ballad braid into and expand one another. The experimentation here is tonal and discursive, where satires bend the language of state bureaucracy and military planning such that they speak directly for once to US neo-imperial interventions occurring across Central America at that time. And the experimentation in Acrylica is transdisciplinary, where a careful attention to the stagecraft of contemporaneous Chicanx theater allows Herrera to push narrative poems that explore the character's political and personal desires and charge scenes. Indeed, the stages of these poems are sites where various positions including any that might be associated with Herrera, the author, are exposed to merciless and clarifying critiques. Defying categorization by taking up such a broad array of experiments ensured that Acrylica would not reap the wages of affiliation in any poetic coterie of its day. Or as the epigraph from Alma Luz Villanueva that opens Acrylica's Terciopelo section plainly states, Quote, and they didn't know or care that I had returned with a new song in my mouth. But Acrylica sings as much to be heard as to cast its song somewhere beyond the furthest circle of ears. We sense this tension between the present and potential audiences when Acrylica's experimentation is figurative. Herrera knows how to activate Federico Garcia Lorca's sense of metaphor as having a central nucleus and its radius of action with the nucleus being the startling effect of the comparison itself, the radius of action being the metaphor sense data that buttresses the comparison on analogic scaffolding that can, with some interpretive effort, be made legible. At key moments, however, Herrera follows Lorca's later tendency to offer symbols whose mere existence are their own justification. Herrera's, quote, the peeling torsos of an eternal stone of rain for example, begs to be taken on faith. And that faith leads us to push along with the text at the edge of the sayable. Though few contemporaries may have had ears for Acrylica's variegated song, the text faithfully casts a call across the chasm of the unsayable toward a future audience, one we believe that is yet to come into being. Our project at its base is to retrieve and rearticulate this text so as to amplify that call. Such a people will meet Acrylica's ongoing articulation and shape-shifting with its own. The book's aesthetic range demands motility, dexterity, and that's how it contests received ideas of a literary experimentation that would advance through discrete historical periods of evermore self-aware or ever more anti-representational art. But this dexterity is also how Acrylica contests the very terms of political struggle that the ruling class makes available. Acrylica's final poem, Forever Maga, uses its self-described beggar's theater to lay bare the discord among generations, among national identities, and among the documented and undocumented who might all be lumped into the broad category of Latinidad. 
Acrylica, though, is not motivated by a desire to impugn the simple fact of sociological fissures in an unstable ethnic category. With every portrait of a Latinx figure in its ballads, with every synthesis of sound and consciousness in its lyrics, with every neo-imperial atrocity laid bare in its satires, Acrylica affirms that Latinidad is as real as each of its iterations that its people are resilient, that its cultural forms are sustaining and available to new urgencies. But while Latinidad is real in its particulars, Acrylica helps us see that Latinidad cannot be believed in the general case. Acrylica's gift to its future audience is to offer in its irrepressible inconsistency a general mode of contesting the very Latinidad that David Duke and others need in order to shore up an idea of whiteness in the self-making imaginations of the nation state and of the people it names as either legal or illegal, citizen or foreigner, white or of color. To believe as an ontological fact a racial ethnic order invented by settler colonists To believe as an ontological fact, a racial and ethnic order invented by settler colonists is to mistake as solid what is always spilling beyond its edges. So we say with nothing but grief that whiteness is not limited to white people. It is an ideology and practice of life that separates self from world so that, Excuse me, it is an ideology and practice of life that separates self from world so that world may become nothing but a means toward the extraction and accumulation of capital, be that capital psychic or material. The double edge of this racial and ethnic order is that any of its non-white positions are mercilessly vulnerable to violence and scapegoating, while any of its non-black positions are simultaneously lured into striving for closer and closer proximity to its fantasized white apex. One way or another, we're constrained, as poet and theorist Fred Moten has said, to use identity against the zombies who invented it. Being caught up in surviving such a system while trying to be legible by its terms keeps us from seeing Latinx investments in anti-Blackness, in systems of extraction, and in nationalisms that serve to pervert land into property. Some 40 years after visionary black and brown feminists coined the terms people of color and women of color, see for reference the Combahee River Collective and the Black Women's Agenda, writer and reproductive justice advocate Loretta Ross had to remind us that, quote, women of color was meant to be not an identity, but quote, a political designation that signals commitments toward meat liberation. In Acrylica, Juan Felipe helps us see that Latinidad can be snatched out of any racial and ethnic order that rests on an imagined naturalization of its categories. That Latinidad can be recontextualized in its political and coalitional potential. Herrera imagines Latinidad as a living, unstable, irrepressible will toward a next articulation. In his text, and his text includes readers in the work of orienting toward what's needed in the moment. We can adapt our resistances and our care. We can shift the horizon of what we imagine beyond whatever the ruling order offers as inclusion, access, or power. That is to say, Acrylica understands any collective identity not as a stable category or an individual project of psychological integration but as a political tactic, a tactic for nurturing and maintaining marginalized, marginalized ways of life to be sure, but also a tactic to be weaponized, altered and abandoned as needed. Forget this and we risk not seeing as Herrera writes of one of his characters in his correspondence with a jailed cousin, quote, that the bars separating our worlds are imaginary, that the free are not free. Now prisoners are still prisoners. As readers, Acrylica calls us beyond the scrim of promised freedom and realized violence and into a social relation convened 
by imagining inside of the book's unbound and unfixed mode. As translators, we hear this call all the more pointed. Herrera created the conditions for an empowered collective in Acrylica's first edition by trusting a handful of friends to render his original text into English. And he offered the new collective that formed among us the same generous and affirming trust. In this way, Acrylica is always a book given over to its own re-articulation. Our aim was never to correct earlier translations, but instead to take seriously Acrylica's call to keep inventing and to take seriously traditions of creative, generative, and avowedly politicized translation. We opt for a landscape of proliferation rather than a gallery of more precise similitude. In our approach, the artifact of the text around which the discipline of literature organizes itself has less authority than the mode of reimagining the world that the text exercises. In accordance with this mode, our translations seek both direct correspondence and compensating effects. These compensating effects might transfer a sonic juxtaposition in Spanish to an image in English, but they might just as likely transfer a set of imagistic associations in Spanish to experiments in typography, drawing, and procedures suggested by viral genetic code of COVID-19. With Herrera's collaboration and in the spirit of his anti-racist commitment, we extended this approach of gener generative translation to moments where the original text offered a sense of Latinidad that excluded blackness and where the text deployed black as a mere adjective naming racial difference. A deeper register exists below representation, down at the level of the consciousness that the text renders in the work of perceiving, naming, questioning, and imagining. Readers of this acrylica, of our acrylica, assume a point of view that would not other blackness, a point of view therefore that may be black or Afro-Latinx. We choose to respond to the ubiquity and persistence of black death in the United States and elsewhere by subsuming the notion of an original text to its next articulation. This next acrylica, hold space for a textual perspective in which Latinidad and Blackness co-create one another, just as Latinidad and Blackness have always informed and co-created one another in life. If translation can be a practice of proliferating designs, then Acrylica, with its absolute trust in re-articulation, with its fundamental love of imaginative possibility, guides us to translate toward forms of life that proliferate at once in antagonism to and despite whiteness. Throughout this introduction, we speak of Acrylica almost as a figure because we read the totality of its pages as the occasion for a collective voice. The voice in the last pages, last passages of the book, though emerging from the stage scene of Forever Maga, is difficult to ascribe to any one of the poem's characters. Instead, a larger voice emerges one stretched and made supple by all of its preceding varied shapes. It is a voice that holds an ardent faith in transgenerational wisdom that promises to show us, quote, where they tuck their ancient bundles in the hills of La Obrera or next to some worn, worn down cross on the side of the road. But it is also a voice that figures the occasion of our gathering as readers, translators, and cosmic dreamers around and beyond the text with one another and toward our next articulation. It is a voice that promises, quote, we'll get etched onto the face of some precipice that no one will see, one over the other, like a capital X above the land to the south, shimmering forever. Though the image affirms permanence, it dedicates this promise to the fugitive and indefinite X. This is the X that migrates from Chicano to Chicanex and Latinx. It is still and is still on the move. The X that marks what remains unaccountable in systems of identitarian value. The X that holds space for the practice of gathering. And in gathering, we bundle together the next shards of transgenerational knowing that will be found beyond the literary, wherever language returns to ritual, 
beyond where the border used to be, unowned but tended to, reinscribed but illegible, sustaining but provisional, unrecognized, unassimilable, unpatriated, together and at home in the hands that carry us across time. I'll stop there and pivot to the to the next stage in the program. Thank you. Thank you for I was um I have so many notes written down and kept thinking, where can I read this? Where can I go back and read everything that he's saying? Because there were so many times that I wanted you to say, wait, 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 go back, say that again. Um, and I imagine I'm not the only one. I um Folks, for you in the audience, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A. You can post them in the chat and we will invite you to unmute. Um, you know, as I was listening and, and feeling, I mean, you mentioned visceral a number of times and I had different visceral reactions in different points of the talk um, because of the depth of description that you shared and the emotions that were conveyed. And so thank you for doing it in that way. Um, and then I kept finding all these parallels to the work, um, to the work that we're all engaged in and committed to and uh, the juxtaposition, and I'm looking at all my notes, the juxtaposition of an evolution of neoliberalism and capitalism and migration and economic and political wars at different points that you talked about and the ways in which um, that all that all impacts this work that we do and people I think often separate this um, philosophical theoretical and the day-to-day -day work that we're engaged in and it's so um, it's so connected and so thank you for bringing those connections to light and forward um, you know and I found myself going back to questions that you posed around what if there are no borders and you said something about imaginary bars that we have created um, and reimagining possibilities. And I just kept jotting things down. So I'd, I'd love for you just to take some time to go even further, uh, to unpack it even more for us, particularly, you know, in that question that I sent to you around when we think about building institutional capacity, you know, and make the connections between all of what you shared what, what does that look like um, so people don't, don't, don't walk away thinking like, okay, this was um, incredible. Now, what does this mean for me in this day-to-day -day work? Because um, for me, I see it's so connected. And I'm wondering if you can say more about that. Yeah, gladly. Thank you. I, but real quickly, I'll, I'll share screen, which I, I failed to do while I was reading uh, just briefly to show uh, uh, the most recent digital layout of the book. And so this is where people can read the second half of the talk. So it'll be here. This is the design. And uh, it opens with the introduction from which I read today. Um, I also want to give a plug for this edition of the book because it has these beautiful photographs from Juan Felipe's archives that really document the cultural life in uh, Chicano, Chicanx, Latinx communities, particularly around the Bay Area, but also in some of his travels to Mexico at the time in the late 1970s through the 80s. Um, so it's going to be a really exciting addition. And it also, over the years, Juan Felipe has developed a practice as a visual artist as well. So you'll see some of that in this edition of the book. Um, as we scroll down, I think we'll hit some of the artwork. There's one example. I want to give a, a loving shout out to our colleague, uh, Maribel Alvarez, who, who showed up in this archive of photographs because she, um, she was in that cultural mix. Uh, at the time as a as a culture worker and thinker and as a poet. So it was very exciting to, to see her represented there. Maribel Alvarez, Associate Dean of, um, of Engagement for the College of SBS. So anyway, folks can, 
can read um, the, the bulk of what I offered today in the book that's coming out as the introduction to the book. Um, in terms of capacity building, yeah, I, I want to quickly review some notes that I had here that I cut out of the main presentation in, in the interest of time. So um, briefly, the Mellon Foundation has funded a, a well, they funded a, a pilot project to create a consortium of 16 Hispanic serving institutions across the country. I believe all research ones, right, Julie? Um, and so um, they tasked the 16 universities with figuring out how to leverage one another's resources to create more capacity for HSI initiatives on their campuses, broadly speaking, and with a focus on creating pathways for Latinx scholars into the professoriate. The grant convened three working groups. One of those three was a working group in poetry. Um, and we have the opportunity, all 16 institutions have the opportunity to apply for new working groups in the next round of the phase, is my understanding, next, next phase of the grant. The pilot poetry working group was led by National Book Award winner Daniel Brzezinski from University of Illinois, Chicago. It included Professor Rosa Alcala from the bilingual MFA program at University of Texas, El Paso, and from University of Arizona's MFA program in creative writing. Uh, the group in included Professor Susan Briante and myself. So we use the pilot year to look inward to critically examine standard pedagogy in our field. We used grant funds to convene leading researchers in the area of anti-racist writing pedagogy who then offered workshops to us and to a small cross-disciplinary cohort of U Arizona graduate students. The program culminated in a public roundtable where workshop leaders and graduate students engaged in an open dialogue. One of the most powerful structural models that appeared through that dialogue is what's called the Laureate Lab at Fresno State University. Laureate Lab is a space set aside for the exploratory, exploratory creative pedagogy of Chicanx poet Juan Felipe Herrera in honor of his being named Poet Laureate of the United States. Notably, Herrera was the first ever Chicanx or Latinx writer to be named to that prestigious post, but universities need not wait until one of their faculty earns an incredibly rare honor like the US laureateship before setting aside space for the kind of teaching and learning Herrera instituted at Fresno State. The Laureate Lab is multifunctional. Unlike traditional classroom space, the lab is dedicated to poetry and creative mixed media projects. So it's really a blending of studio art practices and creative writing practices. While universities might see dedicated space as a loss on their balance sheets because they can't cycle through the maximum number of tuition paying students per day, the mission of a dedicated space, a space can realize some efficiencies. In the case of University of Arizona, for example, we could conceive of a poetry lab space as a new intersection between different campus partners, such as the Creative Writing MFA program, the Guerrero Student Center, and the University of Arizona Poetry Center, and the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry. If we conceive of the space as open 10 to 12 hours per day, staffed by a mix of faculty and graduate students, it can be a community hub for U Arizona students a place to build the peer-to-peer -peer and peer-to-mentor relationships we know are crucial to student success. If we conceive of the space as a site for collaboration between faculty, students, and community partners, we are then mixing lab learning with meaningful community engagement. And this is exactly what they do at Fresno State. If we partner with community groups such as Mexican American Student Services and academic units such as Mexican American Studies that have a history of robust youth outreach and student recruitment, we could place such a lab in the service of a pathway for Latinx students into the University of Arizona. And all of these benefits accrue on top of the pedagogical power that such spaces generate. Studio art teaching practices offer many benefits to the field of writing, and they offer those benefits to all who participate. But Felicia Rose Chavez in her recent book, The Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, makes clear that bringing the process of writing into the classroom, where previously only critique had been privileged, supports marginalized students whose silence in academic spaces has been trained into them 
as a kind of survival skill. So that's that's one model that that I wanted to share that speaks directly to are all of these lofty and rat ideas and, and complicated ideas um, could actually be actualized. Sometimes it's as simple as an institution, a university saying, we hold space and then getting out of the way, right? And trusting that faculty take that responsibility incredibly seriously so that they charge the space with leading ed edge pedagogy that actually justifies its dedication, right? You know, one of the most beautiful things, uh, emotional things brought tears to my eyes was when um, Juan Felipe at the culminating event from our, our uh, pilot phase in the, in the last spring shared a video of the Laureate Lab and they showed um, community, like neighborhood student groups, K-12 student groups coming through the Laureate Lab and going through uh, uh, creative writing and visual art uh, activities that were blended together, facilitated by uh, graduate students in university. Um, as a background in K-12 teaching, it was, and, and as, a, as a parent, it was deeply moving. And it's a, it's a potential that I hope we can realize in some way here. Yeah, oh my gosh, I, I wish that I could have sat in and, and listened and watched in a lot of the meetings that you all did. And I mean, you mentioned, at, at one point you were talking about co-creation in life with Latinidad and Blackness. Um, and that's what I was visualizing when you were saying that this is co-creation, not, not just in like knowledge, but in life amongst these students and groups that come into these labs. So thank you for sharing such a powerful example and an incredible talk. Oh my gosh. Um, as I said, I, I wanna go dig into everything that you had written so I can read it again and experience it again. Uh, we're out of time. I don't know how that happened so quickly. But thank you for being with us. Thank you for kicking off this series. Uh, for folks who are in the audience, please know that you can share questions um, to me, to Monique, and certainly directly to Farid, and we will make sure that those get answered. Um, we will also put the talk up on our HSI initiatives website so it's accessible. Um, I want to be sure to give a huge thanks also to Monique Beltran, who helped to coordinate all, all the pieces of this and help us um, make sure that everything runs smoothly. So thank you, Monique. Um, and want to alert you to two, um, two more events coming up before we log off. One, of course, is our next um, webinar, which is going to be on October 14th at 1 p.m. And it's a Day in the Life of Mariachi Arizona, uh, featuring Alberto Rangel, who is the director of Mariachi Arizona and an instructor within the School of Music. Um, and then also next week on September 21st, 12.30 p.m. Arizona time, 3.30 Eastern, we will have a panel discussion with the Association of American Universities and other member HSIs on critical dialogue on leading innovation, scholarship, and solutions centered on serving this um, this will happen at our new um, DC Center for Outreach and Collaboration, but it's open to all. So if you're interested in listening in on that presentation, it's going to be led, coordinated by Dr. Marla Franco, um, and you can register. We're going to put the link in the chat. Um, so join us next week. Join us for our next webinar next month, um, and please help me give Farid Matuk just an immense Round of applause and gratitude. Thank you for um, everything that you shared with us today. Thank you so much for hosting and organizing and all the work you do. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.